Hello everyone, this is Bob Browner with Community Coronavirus Update number 21. Uh, the uh, themes for today, latest numbers and answering do they say and uh, when to wear a mask. Um, so Nebraska numbers are still on the rise. Uh, I uh, usually get up every morning and kind of update this uh, spreadsheet that I use. Uh, the Johns Hopkins site, you can look at the graph in three different ways. The number going up, uh, the logarithmic scale, which sometimes that's an early sign when this drops that you're past the peak of the epidemic. Uh, and then the daily counts, you'll notice this is really spiky. And the problem with that spikiness is one is people aren't always working on weekends. So you may have a day, some lulls within the weekends. Uh, the virus itself doesn't spread smoothly. There will come in waves and then there's back backlogs of tests where a whole bunch of tests get reported on one day. Uh, and so this is causing some, you know, spikiness of the data, but general trend is that we still are having more cases. Um, and it varies across the state. There's places where I think things are maybe slowing down in some of the hot spots in Grand, Grand Island, but uh, Douglas County is uh, recording 100 plus uh, new cases a day. So it varies across the state. Um, how is Nebraska doing as a whole? Well, we had been a green state a month ago, but we did get a lot of cases surrounding uh, because of our meat processing facilities and then spread uh, secondary to the family members. So as, as a, so our total cases are pretty high. Our fatality rate isn't very high yet, but that's because that lags by about three to four weeks. And so those Grant and Hall County deaths, they're already at 39. So like I predicted a few weeks ago, I thought they'd probably be between 50 and 150, which was the state prediction uh, by, by a month later. So in another week or two, I suspect, unfortunately, we'll be there. Uh, we already have uh, over 125 deaths uh, as of this morning. Uh, I think if you look at the number of infections we already have, we'll probably be at four to 500 deaths by a, a month from now. And that's because of that lag factor that I think people are getting confused about with the data. Here locally, uh, we also have some problem, data problems again. Uh, yesterday, I think about a 90 uh, uh, a case backlog was reported. Those tests were actually weren't drawn this week. They were actually drawn last week, uh, but there was a backlog in the lab where the turnaround time went up to four or five days. So the, there's some funkiness in the data and like, is this, is this when the test was repeat reported or when it was actually drawn or when the patient was infected? And so these 90 or so that reported yesterday were drawn last week, but may have actually been acquired the week before even. And so it creates some time lag issues. And so we have to be a little cautious about looking at daily or weekly numbers because of these time lag issues. Uh, I think there's also some data integrity issues with the Test Nebraska. Uh, our percentage positive drop last week, that's because those were probably Test Nebraska, which is partly more of a surveillance mindset. And then all these ones that were ordered by physicians, which are a higher risk, are going to have a higher percentage. And so we're going to get a lot of fluctuation in the data because of the lack of integration and timely reporting. Uh, so hopefully they'll get the bugs worked out of the Test Nebraska system here in the next week or two so we have a clearer idea of where we are. Uh, so right now it's hard to say whether our tests are, our, our numbers are going up or down until we get some uh, better, uh, more timely reporting and better turnaround time. Another thing I want to talk about is I keep getting these uh, these questions about, well, these are people who are, quote, going to die anyway, or they didn't die of coronavirus, they died with coronavirus, or hospitals are inflating coronavirus deaths for money. Uh, one, I'll start with hospitals. There's not, yes, there may be an incentive for them to, to code coronavirus, but they don't code. The hospitals don't do it. That's the physicians. And the physicians are not going to risk their medical license to falsify medical records. So that's a red herring. Uh, dying of versus with, I think that's just a moot point. You, you either, you're either dead or you're not. And you know, certainly, certainly other diseases cause, make you more likely to die of coronavirus, but still dead people are dead people. And it still is coronavirus that, that sped things along. Uh, and so one way to look at this is excess mortality. This, uh, we have mortality data going back a century or more. And so what the CDC is, they track how many people would typically die and where's a threshold where you see more than expected. Well, here two years ago, this was a bad flu year. And you see these three little blips. Then you see here, and this data is still incomplete, by the way. It takes a few weeks for this data to get in it. And so this, this bar will probably go up as more states start reporting. But essentially, our numbers now already with coronavirus on a national level are far below above a bad flu year. Uh, if you look at uh, New York State specifically, you can see that the, all the, the fatalities from, from corona, excess deaths for coronavirus are exceeding all other uh, uh, deaths combined for the entire state already. Uh, if you go down to the New York City level, you can see that it's not even close. So is there some other mysterious thing causing people death? Well, no, there's no way to hide something like that. That would be maybe four World Trade Center uh planes flying into skyscrapers all at once to cause this much of a peak. So no, this is not an, a, a falsification of any information. This is just that how many people died in New York City that would not have died on a typical uh, six week stretch. And it's not just New York City. Boston uh, was also kind of a kind of a hot spot, not as bad as New York, but pretty bad. But just the Boston numbers alone were able to make Massachusetts a, a fatality rate almost double what everything would have been as well. So this is not uh, any falsification at all. These, is, these are the true deaths and excess mortality 
it takes a little while to get the, this kind of data in, but this is the true measure of how bad coronavirus is. And by the way, we're just getting started. Um, the other thing is, is it's, it's people who are going to quote die anyway. Well, if you look at the data in the XX deaths, it's actually more young people than a lot of people realize. Yes, there are some people in nursing homes who maybe would have died in the next six months or five years. I mean, we're all going to die anyway at some point. So that's sort of a relative term. But there's a lot of people in their 50s and 60s and actually quite a few people in their 20s through 40s. Why this spike? Well, my I don't know. Have conclusive information. I suspect these are the these are the collateral damage of the healthcare workers. Uh, it seems to be that healthcare workers, in a in a sort of out of control mentality, don't have enough pe personal protective equipment, get hit with a higher dose of the coronavirus, and so on an ordinary infection might not have died, but because of they have such a high dose, is the leading theory. That's why that. And so this is probably the collateral damage of healthcare workers right here, which is in yet another reason why you don't want to overwhelm your healthcare system because not only do more people die, but you also take off a take out a significant number of doctors nurses and respiratory therapists. Uh, you may have noticed that there's a little a drop here in children. Why, are, why, is, why is childhood mortality dropping? Well, these are probably the reduction in accidents. Accidents are the leading cause of death and one of the leading causes of death in this age group. So they're not out riding their bikes. They're not getting in car wrecks. Uh, they're not drowning because they're at home. So, you know, this is just a secondary effect. What about Nebraska? Well, we're starting to see the spike. Nebraska, our epidemic just started about four weeks ago, so there hasn't been enough time to see many deaths. You're just starting to see it right now, though. And over the next few weeks, as the, all those deaths from those meat fat processing outbreaks happen, you'll see this number go up. And so, like I say, I, I would bet uh, any amount of money that we're going to have about four to 500 deaths uh, by this time in June as those uh, people start dying, unfortunately. So is social distancing working? So this uh, article came out just a couple days ago in Health Affairs, and the answer is yes. And what they did is they looked at differential spread in counties across the entire country, and they look at almost every county, every and number of days uh, since the, the interventions were spread, how much it happened, and they're additive. And so the thing is, this is kind of like the Swiss cheese like we talked about last week. One thing doesn't work, but you layer two and three and four things together, it makes a huge difference. And so the groups, that the counties that put everything together had a 35 times uh, greater decrease in spread than those that, that did not. And so Yes, the social distancing does in fact work. Social distancing, washing your hands, wearing masks is already proving to be very effective when implemented correctly. And it's also related to how many people are doing it. Uh, so no mask, no service this is gonna be a big push uh, from my organization over the next uh, week or two. We do think masks work. Um, uh, if you haven't read it yet, read Atul Gawande's article. That was one of the key interventions that helped the, the second, prevent the secondary spread to healthcare workers in their hospitals was mask wearing. So he's a big fan of that. Uh, again, you know, the reason why is that if you have an infection and you may be infectious for three to four days before you realize it, and so that three to four days, you're spreading it everywhere without knowing it. We know that just hanging out, talking in a quiet voice or breathing, you're probably mostly only spreading that those droplets three feet, maybe six feet. But if you sing, yell, shout, sneeze, cough, it's going to spread as far as 20 feet with the sneeze. Wearing the mask is what prevents that. That's the big thing. Uh, and so the more we can get people to wear masks when they're out and about uh, around a lot of other people, the better. Um, so think it again, like it's Swiss cheese. And so I think a lot of the confusion comes from one, uh, there's these odd theories about re-inhaling your own bacteria and virus. Well, they're, on your, they're already in you, you're immune to them. That's not a problem. So I don't know where that theory comes from. The other mistake people are making is there were at some questions, including Anthony Fauci saying, would wear a mask protect you? And the answer is not that much because the because it's it could leak around the mask. The big thing is that the person who's sick needs to be wearing the mask. And so people are confusing. It's not one thing or the other thing. You need to do both things. And and if both people wear a mask, it's very effective. And so saying, oh, it doesn't work all the time, that's like saying, well, yeah, if I only put one, one wheel on a motorcycle, it's not going to go either. We need two wheels on the motorcycle. So this to be a very effective invention, we need both sides wearing the mask. And the most important person wearing the mask is the person who might be infected, which may be you, because then it, it may be three to four days before you realize it. Um, so how are various countries? Uh, a few weeks ago, we heard about Oh, Sweden's doing so well. Well, yeah, a month ago they were, but they aren't now. Uh, so quit looking to Sweden as your model because they're now one of the hot spots. Uh, Germany has, was the, one of the early countries and is still green. They've been doing it right for months now. So if you want to look to a model, look to Germany. Uh, they're already sending their kids back to school, and guess what? They're wearing masks because they believe in evidence. They're run by uh, a chancellor who is a former physicist and a PhD, so she is looking at the science. Yes, they are wearing a mask. They're doing on-school testing. This is a person doing their own test, actually, and there are maybe ways you can do that. And, of course, she's got her mask there. Uh, other countries they are doing well, South Korea, Japan. So what is, what's unique about Asians? Well, they've been wearing masks forever. They wear masks, so it works. 
Uh, and then the other problem I have to keep dealing with is they say. I, when I was in training, a psychologist told me the thing that drove her crazy, most crazy, is they say. Well, who are they anyway? But people tend to use that as, as their excuse not to do something, essentially. So what I hear is not all agree, doctors agree with that when I say mass. Well, what kind of doctors? Are they real doctors? Are they doctors who know what they're talking about? And so one thing you need to look at is what the credentials of the doctor you're talking about. And they often have letters after the MD. So in OBGYN, it's FACOG, which Fellow American College of Obstetrics and Gynecology. So if you have a difficult bit delivery of pregnancy, this is who you want to talk to. Cardiology expert, Fellow of the American Cardio of, of Car College of Cardiology. This is the heart doctors. The public health doctors, MD, MPH, Masters in Public Health, sometimes a PhD, but it could be, you know, a PhD in philosophy for a medical ethicist, so it doesn't tell you for sure, but those are the typical credentials. Natul Gawande, and you may have seen Ali Khan and James Lawler on uh, with the governor. These are MD, MPH people. These are the people who have a background in epidemiology. These are the people you should listen to. Not these people who think they know everything, but obviously don't. So the Baker or Shield docs have been completely debunked with what they They did have some valid things from their end. Yes, they are emergency room doctors. They do see the after effects and, and secondary problems of child abuse and things like that. Those are totally true. These guys don't know much about epidemiology. Most doctors only have one to two weeks at best of epidemiology. Uh, also, look at experts you do trust. One I would trust is Bill Johnson here locally. FCC is College of Ch Chest Physicians. He's the lung doctor that takes care of you when you're in the ICU and you might die. So Bill sees this day in and day out, and Bill's not just your average doctor. He's the doctor. Other doctors say, if I'm sick, I want him taking care of me. He recorded this plea uh, on their press release of getting everyone to wear a mask. So Bill, if you don't listen to me, listen to Bill. Wear a mask. Um, and then the reviews are coming out. So here's this evidence review that Atul Kwandi was referring to. The preponderance of evidence indicates that mask wearing reduces transmissibility. Public mask wearing is most effective at stopping spread of the virus when compliance is high, which means we've got to get most people to do it. Uh, it could substantially reduce the death toll and the economic impact. We do got to care about the money. Our fastest way to open up the econ econ economy is getting people to wear masks. So quit being so resistant to this. And the other thing is the cost of intervention is low. You know, the vaccines and viruses, that's going to, or the, and antivirals, that's going to cost a lot of money. Masks are cheap. They can even be homemade. So if we could get everybody to recommend this and start doing it, we could probably get out of this mess a lot faster. So we need to get rid of this resistance for mask wearing, which I'm not quite under sure why people are so resistant for it. Uh, again, it's a physical barrier. So if, if you can't wear a mask, that's why they're erecting those those plexiglass barriers at different restaurants or different you know, checkout counters, because if I cough, smack, it's going to hit the barrier. It's not going to go spreading out here. If I don't have a barrier and I'm wearing a mask, a lot of it's going to get caught in that mask. Not all, but most of it will. It's enough to make a big difference. Uh, the next thing we're going to have to figure out, you know, where do I wear a mask? Where do I don't go? I am still not a fan of going to restaurants at this point on the indoors. So this uh, uh, epidemiology article I referred to a while back, it spread beyond this person beyond six feet. There's a duration problem. When you're a place for an hour, hour and a half, uh, same things goes for a church. So if you're going to do a church service, boy, you better be spread out and everybody ought to be wearing a mask. Otherwise, you are going to get spread just like this in a church service or a restaurant. Uh, so where do I wear a mask? I don't wear a mask all the time. I'm sitting here in my office. If it's just me in the office, I'm not wearing a mask. If it's just Ted, Mary Jo, and I, and we're all spread in different offices, I'm not wearing a mask. Uh, however, if I'm going to be walking about in the community like at a farmer's market where there's a crowd, uh, kind of like that uh, you know, New York City sidewalk-ish, then I wear a mask outside. Otherwise, I don't wear a mask outside. I don't wear it when I'm, when I'm riding my bike. I don't wear it when I'm walking my dog. And when we have a driveway get-togethers, I don't wear it then either. There's enough spread. There's enough. Uh, it's outdoors. But anything indoors with multiple people, you ought to be wearing a mask. Grocery store, checkout counter at Lowe's, any of those places, you should be wearing a mask. Uh, again, we got to think of this for the long haul. We're going to be doing this for a while. We need an organized plan. And so one of the campaigns I've said, again, we're going to try to work on getting more and more businesses to identify themselves as being sort of mask friendly. Uh, if you are a business and you want us to highlight you, put in, put, uh, send us an email, info at healthylincoln.org. Uh, I think the challenge is, is that, yes, I'm, for example, I'm a pretty healthy person. I'm not worried about myself getting coronavirus, but I'm worried about some of my relatives getting it, some of my friends getting it, some of my coworkers getting it. So they, and they need to go to the grocery store too. So the only way to protect them when they go to the grocery store is for everybody to wear a mask. So if you are a business and you want us to highlight us, certainly let us know. Uh, so again, uh, so you know my credentials, where I'm from, where I work, what I do for a living, this is it. Uh, if you want to look at past uh, our articles, uh, we were putting all these on the healthylincoln.org website, as well as some of the mask brochures. So if you want to print out of those mask brochures, uh, drop your own logo on it. We'll have those on the website so you can print out your own version and put your own logo for your work site. Uh, 